All right, so this is kind of a continuation of last week's message. So if you weren't here, I'm going to catch you up in like, oh, three minutes or less, okay? So, and how many of you know that even if you were here last week, if I threw out a test right now, hey, what did I share last week? You'd be like, ah, uh, ah. Uh. So this is, this is for all of us this morning, not just if you weren't here. But last, last week we started talking about, and we're going to be talking about it this morning, the world's fire. We're going to be talking about the world's fire. And I'll explain that as we go along. But the message started out because there's a story in the Bible where Peter ends up at warming himself at the wrong fire. Peter is standing at the wrong fire warming himself, and he also finds himself denying Jesus at that same fire. He denies Jesus three times. Three times he denies him. If, if, if you know anything about that, Jesus said, Peter, you, even you're going to deny me three times. And what did Peter say? Peter's like, oh, no, 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 no. Not me. No way, Lord. No way. They, they might all, those guys, those guys, man, they're wimps. They, they might deny you, but I will never, I will never deny you. And he finds himself at this, at what we're going to call the world's fire, denying Jesus three times. And we're going to look at that this morning. But, but we talked about this last week. You don't end up in front of the wrong fire overnight. You don't just wake up one morning doing, you don't just wake up one morning in sin. Usually it's a process. Usually there's steps that led you to that place. There's steps that led you to that sin. There's steps that led you away from God. Nobody wakes up in the morning just thinking, I'm going to stop serving God this morning. There's steps, and if you know anybody that's backslidden or fallen away, it's been a process. There are things that have taken them away from God. And that's where Peter was at. He didn't just wake up that morning, well, I think I'll deny Jesus three times. There were some things that happened, and last week I gave you those three things. Here they are in a nutshell real quick. Number one, Peter was focused more on his love for Jesus than Jesus' love for him. We talked about that last week when you used uh, John as the example. If you know in John's gospel, John always referred to himself as the disciple what? The disciple Jesus loved. Peter, on the other hand, always boasted about how much he loved Jesus. Whereas John boasted about how much Jesus loved him. And listen, it's not that, that John didn't love Jesus as much as Peter did. And it's not that Jesus didn't love Peter as much as he loved John. It was just that for some reason, John got it. John got it. John got the revelation that, hey, Jesus loves me. Je and when you get that revelation, man, it changes everything. It changes everything. Well, John got that rev revelation, but Peter was always trying to prove his love for Jesus. And listen, when you're trying to prove your love for Jesus, when you're trying to prove your love for anybody, it's a job. It's a job, and it's work, and it's something you could probably not sustain in the long run. So, G so Peter was constantly trying to prove his love. Listen, you don't have to prove your love for Jesus. He's already approved of you. He's already approved of you, and, that, and, and that's what we talked about. We talked about that in the sense that, listen, all your sacrifice, all your giving, all you're doing, it can't be to prove something. It's got to be out of a love that Christ has for you. It can't be to prove anything. First John 4, 15, it said this. We looked at this last week. We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. Come on, bottom line. We love him. Because he first loved us. So Peter was all wrapped up in, 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 and so self-assured of his love for Jesus. But what he really needed to recognize was God's love for him. Here's the second thing that happened to Peter that led him to that wrong fire. Peter slept when he should have been praying. Remember the story in Mark chapter 14. I'll go through it really quick. Jesus goes up on the mountain to pray. He leaves some disciples at the bottom. He goes a little further. And he has Peter, James, and John. And he tells them, hey, you guys, stay here. Keep watch while I go and pray. Jesus goes and prays and he comes back and what are they doing? They're sleeping away. They're sleeping away. Now, here's the part of the story that you had to catch. Jesus looks at Peter. How many of you know Peter's old name? Peter's old name was Simon. Jesus changed that name about three years earlier. Now Jesus comes down from the mountain, sees Peter sleeping while he should have been praying. And what does Jesus call him? He calls him, hey, Simon. Hey, Simon, why did he call him? Why didn't he say Peter? He calls him Simon. And, and here was our point last week. Listen, 
when your prayer life goes to sleep, your past wakes up. So Jesus calls Peter by his past, by his old name, by the name Simon. When your prayer life goes to sleep, your past awakens, and you will find yourself at the wrong fire or heading to the wrong fire. Here's the last one we talked about last week. Peter followed from a distance. Listen, you will always find yourself at the wrong fire eventually if you're following Jesus from a distance. Yeah, sometimes it's uncomfortable following Jesus. Sometimes it's tough. But when you follow at a distance, listen, you will get lost. We talked a little bit about that last week, man. If I told you I get frustrated sometimes when I tell somebody, hey, follow me there, right? Follow me. And I take off and they're like, you know, and, and I'm driving the speed limit at least. Okay, I'm not driving 80 miles an hour. I'm driving the speed limit and I keep looking behind me. Ah, I lost them again. I lost them again. Why? Because they're not following closely. They're following afar off. They're going to get lost. It is the same for us spiritually, and it's exactly what happened to Peter. He was following from afar, which led him to the wrong fire. So that's what we talked about last week. If you, you know, I summed it up really, really quick. So maybe you can, uh, if you want, you can go to the website and you can listen to last week's message. But I want to take over where I left off. So let me give you a couple scriptures, show you where we're at. Scriptures are, if you've got your Bibles, John chapter 18, verse 18. Old ones. All right, here we go. John 18, verse 18. Now watch this. Jesus has already told all of his disciples, hey, you're all going to betray me. And Peter stood up, no way, not me. We talked about that. Here we are in John chapter 18, verse 18. Jesus has been arrested, and here we go. <clears throat> it was cold, and the servants and officials, who? The servants and officials stood around a fire that they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Let me give you one more. Mark 14, 54. Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. All right, so here we go. Peter hanging out with them, warming himself at the fire, ready to betray Jesus. Here we go. He's at the wrong fire. And when we talk about this wrong fire, you're going to get a picture of what I'm talking about. I keep calling it the world's fire or the wrong fire. You'll get a better understanding of that as I go along, okay? But he is literally standing at the wrong fire in the sense that he is warming himself at a place that he shouldn't be. He's warming himself in a place that he shouldn't be. And I'm going to show you that and I'm going to show it to you this way. I'm going to show you that the world's fire has three characteristics, all right? So you ready for that? Take a notes. Here's the first characteristic of the world's fire. Number one, it's attractive. It's attractive. Now, let's get back to just normal. This isn't spiritual. You ever notice how, uh, I'm trying to look for the right word, how mesmerizing a fire can be? How many of you know what I'm talking about? How mesmerizing, you ever just sit in front of a fire and you're just kind of lost sometimes, right? You just kind of glued to that fire. You end up like in a, in a, not a trance, but you're just staring at the fire. You know, whether it's a campfire, or whether it's a, a fireplace at home, you're, you're attracted. There's something about a fire in the natural that is just attracting. You know, it's attracting. You could just sit there and just watch that fire. Just, you, get, you end up mesmerized or, or glued to it in a sense. How many of you have fireplaces at home? Most houses do anymore. Um, we have one. We had a fireplace at most of the houses we live, but we don't use it very often. How many of you use your fireplace very often? Maybe just because of, of where we live and everything else. But we don't use our fireplace very often. But I have noticed this throughout the years. There is one morning in particular that we almost always seem to use our fireplace. How many of you know what morning that is? Christmas morning. Christmas morning. We, and we always have a nice little fire going in the fireplace, you know. And I, and I can remember times in different houses. I don't know how many of you have ever done this. But I can remember times in other houses where we didn't have a fireplace. How many of you have ever done this? So you turn on that channel on the TV. Anybody else ever done that, right? And it's a fire. And that's all it is. There's some Christmas music used to go on, and it's a fire. And it just stays a fire the whole time. We've done that, too, because, because there's something about that fire that is attractive. So here's what usually happens on a Christmas morning. You know, especially when the kids were young. But we'd, so we'd have the fireplace going, you know, and they'd all, come, they'd all come out and they'd all be around the fireplace. Because it's a place of attraction. They were attracted 
to that fire because of its warmth and just to look at it. They were attracted to that fire on Christmas morning until what? How many of you know? Until what? Right? Until presents came out, right? All of a sudden, that fire lost its attraction because of presents, right? Eh, some of you already know where I'm going with that, huh? That fire lost its attraction because of presence. Now, let me tell you this about the world's fire. The world's fire is the same way. The things of this world, the things of this world can be very attractive. They can be luring. They can be even be mesmerizing at some times. But listen to me. But, but God's presence, not presence as in gifts, but God's presence should override the attraction of the world's fire. God's presence should override that. Let me give you a scripture. 1 John 2.15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. So do not what? Do not love the world and do not love the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. It's not in them. Do not love the world nor love the things of this world. It's not saying you can't have some of the things of this world, okay? It is not saying you can't have some of those things, but when your love for or your attraction to those things is greater than your attraction to the Lord, that's when you're in trouble. That's when, listen to me, that's when the love of the Father is not in you. Do you see that? When your attraction for the things of this world, when your attraction for the world is greater than your attraction for God and the things of the Lord, that's when the love of the Father is not in you. Now, because think about it. Let's, let's be honest just for a moment. Okay, you're in church, so be honest. There are things in this world that are attractive, okay? If you're out there trying to be holier than thou and you're telling me, no, nothing in this world attracts me, Troy, you're lying, okay? How, come on. How many of you would not like to have a nice house? Come on. Every one of you wants a nice house without plumbing problems, without any. Come on. How many of you want a nice house? I do. I'll stand up here right now and tell you, I would love to have a nice house. I would love to have a gated. I'd love to have a mansion. I would love to. Okay. How many of you would love to have a nice car? How many of you would love to drive around a Ferrari? Well, maybe not everybody wants a Ferrari. I'd love to drive around a Ferrari. Okay. How many of you would love to drive around a brand new car, a brand new truck? Come on. That's not attractive to you. Man, some of you that are, that, are, that are single this morning, come on, how would you like to have a spouse that's not attractive to you? Come on, all of those things and more, all of those things are attractive. Those are things of the world that, that are attractive. And listen to me, they're not bad. They're not bad. And what I want you to see in that illustration, what I'm talking about is there are things in this world that will always, that will always be attractive. But when they start becoming more attractive than the things of God, that's when you know you're headed toward the wrong fire. That's when you know you're headed in the wrong direction. Listen, you can call it whatever you want, but listen to me. My God will not settle for second place. He just won't. And I don't care what you call it, whatever you want, but my God will not take second place to anything or anybody. Period. Period. Let, let, let me put it this way. I, I wrote it this way because maybe, maybe you could understand it a little better sometimes when you break something down and make it really simple. My wife takes second place only to God. Okay? And she's okay with that. Okay? My wife takes second place only to God. If I say that I love my wife, and now listen to the wording. If I say that I love my wife and... I'm attracted to other women. And let me put it this way. The love of my wife is not in me. Do you see that? It's the same as what the scripture is saying. If I try to say, oh, I love you, Lord, but I'm attracted to somebody else, to other women, the love of my wife is not in me. And I'm probably in big trouble too, right? But the love of my wife is not in me. It, it, it's not in me. Listen, here's the key. The key is, what am I attracted to? What are you attracted to? And, and, and listen, to stand up here and to say, well, there are no attractive women out there. Well, that would be an insult to all of you ladies, right? 
That would be an insult to everybody. To say, well, there's just no, there's no attractive women out there. That would be about as ridiculous as saying that the world has no attraction. It, it, it's not that. Here's the key. Here's the key. The key is what am I attracted to? What are you attracted to? What am I attracted to? My wife or other women? My God and the things of the Lord or the world and the things of this world? What attracts you? What are you attracted to? Listen, listen. Attraction is the first step. It's the first step. And here's what I want to show you. You don't even have to do some of these things. But attraction is that first step. You haven't even done anything yet. Watch this. Here, here we go. Back to our story. Peter's finding warmth in places that he would never have gone. Do you see that in our story? Peter is finding warmth in places that he never would have gone. In places that he just didn't belong. He didn't belong there. Peter's finding warmth in... And, and maybe for you, a better illustration is maybe today you're finding warmth in places that you've been delivered from in your past. And now you're feeling attracted or drawn back to those places. Peter is finding, finding warmth with people who were not his people. He's finding warmth, fellowship with people who were not his people. These weren't his crowd. They didn't have his convictions. They didn't have his desires. He's finding warmth. He's warming himself in a place that he shouldn't be at with people that aren't even his people. They're not his crowd. He pretends... He's pretending like he belongs. How many of you see that here? Come on, if he would have just, if he'd have been standing around that fire, come on, he'd have been standing around that fire saying, yeah, that's the Messiah right there. I've been with that guy for three years, three and a half years. How many of you know that wouldn't have gone well for him? So he's standing in front of this fire pretending like he belongs. He puts his hands out there. He puts his hands out there. He's in that fire. He's warming himself the same way they do. And I'm reading this story and I'm thinking, how could he? How could he? After being with Jesus for three and a half years, how could he? Listen, here's how he could do it. When you follow from a distance, when your prayer life goes to sleep, your enemy, listen to me, your enemy, the devil, will make sure there's an attractive fire for you to get warm by. He will make sure, he will make sure there's an attractive fire nearby for you to keep warm. And that's what's going on in our story. He will make sure there's a place for you to stick your hands into. A place where your eyes are glued to. A place where your heart is attracted to. Please listen to me. This, this is so important. When the fire of God is, 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 no longer, is no longer there in your life, the world's fire will become more and more attractive. And you will be drawn away. Man, I've heard people say... <laughs> I wrote this down. I've heard people say, come on, how many of you have ever heard this? The Bible is boring. I've heard Christians, I've heard Christians say, the Bible is boring. I've already read it. I've read it a couple times. It's the same old book. It's the same old book. Listen to me for a minute. It's the same old glass of beer, right? Come on, it is the same old shot of tequila. It's the same old movie or TV shows. It's the same old, same old girlfriend, whatever you want to call it. It's the same. Listen, it's, it, it, listen. Ah, how can I word it? If something, to, to something that it doesn't, it doesn't get old when you're attracted to it. Nothing, somebody, nothing. It doesn't get old if you're attracted to it. When the fire of God begins to dim in your life, the things of this world begin to get attractive to you. You'll become more and more attractive to it. So the first thing about this world's fire, number one, it's, it's attractive. Here's number two. Here's number two. The world's fire, ready, is addictive. It's addictive. And, and, and I'm writing this down and, and I'm thinking, why is it for the most part we're addicted <laughs> We're addicted to things that are just not good for us. You ever notice that? Come on, I have never heard, and you'll never hear it come out of my lips. I've never heard anybody say, man, I've just got this addiction for broccoli. I can't get enough, <laughs> okay? You've, I've never heard anybody say that. It'll be the last thing you ever hear me say, right? But I've never heard anybody say, man, I'm just so addicted to salads. Or even this one, I'm just so addicted to water. I'm just so addicted to water. No, what do we usually hear? Seriously. 
Oh man, coffee. I'm so addicted to coffee. And listen, I, I, I'm going to give you a few. These aren't bad things if you're thinking, oh man, I'm not coming back to this church. They won't even let me drink my coffee. They won't even, listen, that's not what I'm saying. But come on, how many of you know, man, we can get so addicted to coffee. Listen, you run into people. And, 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 and I think we would all agree there are some people that you don't want to meet them if they haven't had their morning coffee, right? You're like, you know, come back later, go get your coffee and come back, right? But there are people that are, they're so addicted to even coffee. How about soda? Come on, soda. I've been talking to a few people. They were t- talking to somebody who was drinking Diet Coke, and he's like, I'm done drinking Diet Coke. I've got, I, I know some people, Dr. Pepper. Oh, man, they're so addicted to even, to even Dr. Pepper, right? Or, so Diet Coke, pizza. And again, these things aren't bad, okay? These things aren't bad. Pizza. Ice cream. Mmm, I'm making you hungry already. Okay, now we'll get a little bit bad. How about alcohol? Cigarettes. And now, now even, uh, even, even the vape thing is going on, right? These things get, they're addictive. You start doing some of these things and they become addictive. And actually, honestly, I think number one and number two kind of go together. I think if, be, before something gets addictive, it was probably attractive, Right? I think before, no, most of us don't get addicted to things that are just flat out ugly, right? Before something gets addictive, it, we were usually attracted to it in the first place. We're usually attracted to it in the first place. Um, I, I, I don't drink alcohol just, just because, and this isn't a condemnation thing, this is just because I don't want to cause anybody to stumble, especially even in my own family. You know, I don't want my kids to ever think, well, my dad used to get drunk all the time, so it must be okay, or my dad drank. So I've just decided as a pastor, as a Christian, that I'm not going to drink alcohol, okay? But now, now, when I watch, and, and pretty much all I watch on TV is sports, when I watch sports on TV, do you know how attractive <laughs> that glass of beer pouring into that cold glass looks? I don't even drink. And I'm like, man, that looks good. Man, that looks, it's attractive. I'm, I'm about to, maybe it's because it's the NBA and, and Jim Beam must be like the number one contributor to, to the NBA. They have commercials with Jim Beam. How many of you know what Jim Beam? It's like bourbon or whiskey or, or, or it, it's strong, okay? It's strong. Have you ever drank bourbon or whiskey? I mean, you take a shot of bourbon or whiskey and you're like, <laughs> I, I've never done it. I've just been told that, okay? But, but listen, listen. They nev- you never see a picture of Jim Beam in a commercial. They pour it over these, like, perfect ice cubes, right? And it's got this amber golden color. And, and they're pouring it, and you're like, man, that's attractive. Man. But they never, even in the commercials, they never really show the guys drinking it, right? They never show the guy going. <laughs> right? They just show him pouring the glass. And it looks so attractive. I mean, if you go to the theaters, I- I'm convinced I am convinced that the movie theaters have a sublineal message up there. there. There's something going on when they pour that Coca-Cola at the movie theater and that popcorn is popping, right? There's a sublineal message somehow behind that screen or something because the minute you see it, you're attracted to it, aren't you? You're like, honey, go get some popcorn. Honey, you don't even like popcorn, right? But you're like, oh, that looks so good. Usually, whatever it is, even pizza, you see those pizza commercials and the cheese is hot and it's kind of, oh, it looks so great, right? Listen. There's something usually, it's attractive before it becomes addictive. It's attractive before it comes, becomes addictive. Listen to me. The things of this world are the same way. You will tend to be attracted to them before you find yourself addicted to them. Be careful. You know you're headed toward the wrong fire when it starts to become an addiction. So Peter, so Peter is at this fire. And he's standing at this fire. Remember, this is Peter. And he denies even even knowing Jesus three times. He denies even even knowing him. With all, we talked about this last week, with all that Peter has seen and done. This is Peter who walked on water with Jesus. Now he's standing before the wrong fire and he denies even knowing him. Even knowing him. Now watch this. Here's what's kind of funny about this story. He denies knowing Jesus to who? I'm just going to tell the story. You have to read it in your Bible if you want. He denies knowing Jesus to a servant girl. Not a Roman guard. Not a high priest. Picture it this way. A middle school girl. With no authority. No influence. 
He denied. She asked him just a simple question. She asked him just a simple question. Weren't you with Jesus? That's it. That was the question. Weren't you with Jesus? You know what Peter's answer? I don't even know who you're talking about. This guy, he walked on water with this guy. He'd seen raised the dead, open blind eye, all of these things. And this simple little girl says, hey, weren't you with Jesus? I don't even know who you're talking about. If you know the story, by the third time she asked him, he begins to cuss and swear. But this is still just the first time, okay? So I'm reading this story, and I know he's standing at the wrong fire, and I know this is, but, and so she says, hey, weren't you with Jesus? No, I don't even know who you're talking about. So I'm reading this story, and I'm thinking, okay, yeah, hostile environment. One time, you know, I'm going to cut him some slack, right? He denied Jesus one time. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to cut him a little slack, right? A second time, a second time somebody says, or the gal says, hey, you, I know you're with, you were with him. No, I don't even know. Listen, the second time, now, now picture yourself there, think about it. At some point, this second time, I'm thinking, I need to get away from this fire. Aren't you? Right? At some point, at least the second time, I'm like, man, I got to get out of here. I need to get away from this fire. That's the second time, right? Now, third time. Third time. Less than 24 hours after Peter told Jesus, I will never deny you. Less than 24 hours after he tells Jesus, I'll never deny you. Yeah, all those little lightweights, they might deny you, but I will never deny you. Less than 24 hours, here he is for the third time denying Jesus. I'm reading this story. I'll die for you, Peter's like. And I'm reading this story, and I'm thinking, seriously? What is he still doing there? Do you ever think of it that way? What is he still doing there? I'd have left after the first time, or at least after the second time. What is he still doing there? It's because he was attracted, and he was addicted to that world's fire. I'll explain this in a moment in a moment, but he was attracted or addicted to it. Listen to me. You start to do that thing, okay, whatever that thing is for you, and you think, this is probably wrong. I probably shouldn't do this. I probably shouldn't be here. But you're drawn to it. You're drawn to it. And before you know it, all of a sudden, you're addicted to it, whatever it might be. Listen, it's the enemy's plan because when it becomes when it becomes an addiction, when something, anything, when it becomes an addiction, it overrides everything in you. When something becomes an addiction, it overrides everything, everything. Listen to me, even the things of God, even the things of God. When something becomes an addiction, it'll override even the things of God in your life. So the world's fire, is, 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 the things of this world are attractive, they're addictive. And here's the third and last one. Number three, the world's fire. It destroys your relationship with Jesus. It will destroy your relationship with Jesus. You can look, look this story up later, but it, the story is in Luke chapter 22. And Luke chapter 22, it's telling us about this event. But in Luke, it tells it a little different way. It tells us that after Peter... After he denied, think, and picture this, this is like heart-wrenching to me. After Peter denies Jesus the third time, in Luke 22, it says this. It says, the Lord looked at him. The Lord, think about it, man. You're standing at the wrong, warming yourself at the wrong fire. You've told Jesus, I'll never deny you. He said, yeah, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster even crows. You know, no way, man, I would die for you. All of a sudden, now you're standing at the wrong fire. You've denied him a third time. I think he heard this, or whatever. That's a lousy rooster, but you got the point, right? I think he hears, it, hears this rooster crow. And according to Luke 22, it says, the Lord looked at him. The Lord looked at him, and it goes on. It says, and he wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. He grieved. He was grieved. Peter broke down. Peter broke down. It, it, it was like, it was like the, a, a wedge or, or a separation almost was, 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 was put in, 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 in his relationship with Jesus. It was like there was something that came between him and Jesus. It was like a wedge or a separation that came into, in his relationship with Jesus. And Peter was like, man, I blew it. I blew it. 
and he wept bitterly. And I'm sure he was thinking, it'll never be the same. I can never get forgiveness. It's over. It's over. My relationship with Jesus will never be the same again. Maybe you've been there. Maybe, maybe you're there this morning. Maybe you've, you've been attracted to the things and maybe you, you, you've been addicted to things. And maybe the same things that you've been a, attracted and a, addicted to are the things that you've already been delivered from in your past. Well, listen, Peter, Peter's got his hands in that fire. He's got his hands in that fire. And, his, and, 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 he, and he denies him a third time. And his relationship with the Lord is broken. His relationship with the Lord is broken. Maybe you're there this morning. And maybe, maybe, maybe you've, not, you've not done anything. But you, maybe you're just getting warm by that fire. You're slowly destroying your relationship with the Lord. Listen, let me, let me show you what happens. Because it doesn't end there for Peter. It doesn't end there for Peter. It does get better for Peter. And I'll show you the solution in just a moment. But how many of you know it doesn't end there? It doesn't end there. You think at this point in my story, as I'm telling it, you think Peter would change. You think Peter would turn around, right? Repent and turn around at this point, right? He's like, oh, man, I've just denied God. He said I would have just. You think he would repent and turn around? Nope. Watch this. The next place we see Peter, you know where it's at? He's gone back to his old life. He's gone back. Something happened at that point. It, when he's at the wrong fire warming himself, his relationship with the Lord was broken. There was a separation. A wedge was put in there by Peter, not by the Lord. And he went back to his old life. The next time we see Peter, he's out fishing. He's out fishing. Here's why. And, and I need to nail this home. Peter had regret, not revival. You think, well, that's kind of the same thing. No, 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 no. Peter had regret, not revival. Peter felt regret. The Bible says that he, he wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. He regretted denying Jesus three times. He wept bitterly only to go back to his old life. Regret is not a cure. Listen to me. How many of you know Jesus? Jesus. Judas felt regret. You know that? Come on, you know the story. Judas betrayed Jesus, right, for 30, 30 pieces of silver, right? Judas, after he betrayed Jesus, the Bible tells us he felt regret. After Judas betrayed Jesus, he felt regret. Listen, he gave the money back, or he tried to. He gave the money back. He tried to buy back his mistake, in a sense. He tried to buy back his regret. He tried to buy back his sin. He tried to buy back forgiveness. He regretted what he did. Here's the crazy thing about Judas. And, and this is just my, my guess or my observation. If you know the story, he regretted what he did. And how many of you know he went out and hung himself? I think, and this is just what I'm thinking, okay? I think he probably hung himself not far from where Jesus would be hung on a cross and pay the real price for his forgiveness and his sin and his regret. You see, but, but, but listen, listen. They had regret and not revival. Regret is not the cure. And maybe you're there this morning, you're right there this morning, and you're like, man, I regret doing this, I regret doing that. That won't change anything without revival. Listen, to today in our nation, and not just our nation, the church today, I think today, honestly, I think most real Christians, I think most real Christians regret, if you were around back then, regret the fact that prayer was taken out of school on their watch. I bet most Christians that were around that time regret that prayer was taken. I bet most real Christians regret ever allowing abortion to spiral to the point that it's, a, that it's at today, where you can get an abortion minutes before a baby can be born. I bet most real Christians regret that. I bet most real Christians regret having ever allowed God to be taken out of our nation. I bet most real Christians regret some of those things, that the, that the cross is no longer... Man, the, the cross is offensive in our nation. Can you believe that? The flag is getting to be where it's offensive. I, I bet most real Christians regret the fact that we've gotten to that point. But now here's my point in all that. I do believe, and, and just from watching the news and different things, I believe the church is waking up a little, a little. But listen to me. And this is for our nation. This is actually for us, though. Re regret without revival is not going to change a thing. It's not going to change a thing. And for us today, here's what God is telling us today. God doesn't ask you to make things right. He says, come to me, get right with me, 
and will make things right in your life. Him and you together will make things right in your life. So Peter goes back to his old life. He's out fishing. Now here's the solution. Here's the cure. He goes back to his old life. If you know the story, he's out fishing. And then what happens? There's Jesus on the shore. Think of it. He's backslidden, basically. He's back to his old life. He's out fishing. And who's he see up on the shore? If you know the story. There's Jesus on the shore. Peter sees Jesus. And what's he got going? What's Jesus got going on that shore? He's got a fire. He's got a whole different fire going on that shore, right? So Peter now sees Jesus on the shore. He has a fire burning. I love Jesus. He's got breakfast prepared, right? He's got some Egg McMuffins cooking on the fire or some fish, whatever, right? But, but he sees Jesus. He's on the shore. He's got a fire burning. He's got breakfast prepared. And what's he doing? He's calling Peter's name. He's calling. Jesus is on the shore. He's got a fire burning, breakfast cooking, and he's calling out, Peter, Peter. And, and watch what he asks him. He says, how's your fishing going? Basically, here's what Jesus is asking Peter. How's your life? How's your life going, Peter? How is your life going? And, and you know Peter's response, right? I haven't caught anything all day. And you got to you gotta know that Jesus is probably chuckling like, like he didn't know, right? Jesus is like, yeah, all right, I knew that. I knew that. I knew that. But Jesus is like, yeah, I know that. But what does Jesus tell him to do? Throw your net on the other side, right? And this is all just so you understand the context of the story. Throw your net on the other side. And what begins to happen? literally fish start jumping out of the water into the net out of the water into the boat and what does peter do at that point peter jumps out of the boat and into the water and he swims all the way to the shore to get to jesus right to get to probably the biggest catch he's ever had he jumps out of that boat and swims to jesus and now watch this here's where our story peter finds himself warming at a different fire peter now finds himself warming at a different fire a fire built by jesus a fire built by jesus listen at the other fire peter got warm at this fire peter gets restored at the other fire peter denied knowing jesus three times at this fire peter reaffirms his love for jesus three times at this fire, this fire, man, Jesus builds a fire, not to judge him. Jesus has a fire going, not to judge us. He knows where you've been. He knows what you've done. He wants to restore you this morning. He wants to restore me. Like Peter, li 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 listen, later, uh, later, I'm not going to get into this part, but you, you got to see this if you know the Bible. Later, Peter, how many of you know later Peter would encounter another fire? How many of you know that? Later, Peter would be in the upper room, right? Yeah, some of you know what I'm talking about. Later, Peter would encounter another fire. It was on the day of Pentecost when tongues of fire came upon all of those in the upper room. And Peter was in that room. Peter was one of those. So later on, Peter would encounter another fire. Listen to me. I'm wrapping up. Something happens when we encounter the fire of God. Something happens when we encounter the fire of God. Something happens when we encounter the presence of God. Something happens when we surrender all of our lives to him completely. Man, when he's our number one attraction, something happens. Listen to me. For the rest of his life, watch this for Peter. For the rest of his life, Peter shares the gospel with power and boldness. And watch this. And yes, he would even give his life. For Jesus. You know the story? This same guy that said, I'd even die for you. And then he couldn't even stand up three times to a little middle school girl. Ends up giving his life for Jesus. And if you know the story, when they were about ready to kill Peter, Peter, they were going to crucify Peter. If you know the story, history tells us that Peter said, no, 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 no. I'm not even worthy to be crucified like my Lord. And he asked to be crucified upside down. Because he didn't even feel worthy to die in the same manner that Jesus would die. This same Peter who was swarming at the world's fire, at the wrong fire, now has an encounter with the fire of God and he has changed completely. He never backslid again that we know of, that we read or anything. He's walking in power and boldness. He literally gives his life for the Lord. 
Here's my last verse. Last verse, Hebrews 12, 25. Our God, for our God is what? A consuming fire. For our God is a consuming fire. You know, we have we have Christian language. I don't even know that. We have Christian language that we use. Woo, man, she's on fire. We, we have language that doesn't really mean what it says, right? How many of you have ever been on fire for God? Yeah, you've never been literally though, right? I mean, did somebody like light you on fire, right? But, but, but even in the world's term, we use that term, right? We use that. To, man, Kawhi Leonard was on fire the other night, right? The night before that, Steph Curry was on fire. Monday night, the Warriors will be on fire, okay? Hope, oh, right? But how many of you know, this girl is on fire, right? Can't sing. Was she on fire? Was Steph Curry on fire? They're not literally on fire. And I happened to Google that to say, well, what does that really mean? You know what? In, in our language, you know, things don't mean, what you know, shut up doesn't mean shut up anymore, right? If a young person says, shut up. It's not an insult to you, okay, adults. They're like, whoa. But but on fire, it means it means they were doing something. Man, they were on fire. They were doing something very well. Or or I like this one. They had a string of successes. They had a string of successes. Now watch this. Put all of this together. Our God is a consuming fire. Consume had a few meanings. Here's two of them. Number one, to do away with completely. Consume means to do away with completely. Our God wants to do away with everything else in our lives completely so that he is the number one attraction in our life. And listen, here's the thing about God. God says that if we will what? Seek him what? First, if he will be our first attraction, he'll give us everything else. He'll give us everything else, but he says, I need to be your first, first attraction. Everything else, everything else has to be completely done away with. And here's the second meaning. To engage fully or completely. Our God wants to be completely and fully engaged with us. He's an all-consuming fire. He's an all-consuming fire. Not just a fire to get warmed by, but a fire to embrace a fire to, that, that wants to consume us from the inside out. And listen, when that happens, when that happens, you'll be changed from the inside out. You'll be changed from the inside out and your life will never be the same. I believe once you've had an encounter with the fire of God, like Peter, you'll never be the same. You will never be the same. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the message. You can check us out on Instagram, Facebook, or online at ignitechurchoc.com.